And let's go to the word, please. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel. We are going to begin looking at something interesting this morning. Prior to that, I just want to share with you briefly of how important it is for us to know the right way to pray. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 draws a clear distinction between the Christian believer and heathen. When you're talking about heathen, it's talking about people who don't know God. They don't know the living God. They may have gods that they worship. Remember, every man worships something. Even the man who says, I don't believe in God, worships something. He worships the belief that there is no God. Amen. Every man has something that he worships and whatever he worships becomes God to him. But here in Matthew's Gospel chapter 6, the Bible starts off with Jesus talking about how important it is for us to set apart time to be alone with him. Also to maintain relationship, Father, and not to pray like the heathen pray. Because the heathen have it all wrong. They think if they keep repeating often enough, well, God will hear and answer prayer. God doesn't answer prayer on that basis. Instead, he answers prayer because he has promised us something and he'll back what he has promised us. Hallelujah. That's why he answers prayer. And the second reason you find that God answers prayer is because we are in a relationship. When we are in a relationship, we, we become his children. So if he will not do it for us, then for whom will he do it? Simple. It's easy for us to relate to that in a family context. In a family context, if parents will not do for us, or if loved ones will not do for us, then who's going to do for us? Now let's look at verses 8 onwards. And underline the beginning part of verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Don't be like them. Don't. For your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Continually, Jesus is emphasizing fatherhood. You have a need? Well, even before you ask, he knows. Then you may ask, then why ask? Well, when you ask, it gets God into a place where he is able to work legally for you. Now look at what the devil does. What does the devil do? He doesn't work legally. He works illegally. He is a thief. Jesus said he is a murderer. He is a liar from the very beginning. He will not do things the right way. He is illegally operating even on this earth. But when Jesus says... Your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. He is trying to emphasize, be assured that if you have a need, your father will provide. What things? Circle the word things. Remember, the church must never get confused with materialism. The church can have physical, material prosperity. But materialism is never promised in the word of God. Materialism is a different concept altogether. Materialism is a concept of a never-ending quest for things. You always want things. It's a compulsion. It is demonic. Please write it down what I'm saying. Sometimes you'll meet people in the church. You won't be able to distinguish what is prosperity, what is materialism. Remember, the God kind of prosperity operates on God's principles. Sowing and reaping. Giving and receiving. Seed time, harvest time. It never comes just like that. It's always based on biblical principles. There's no shortcut to God kind of prosperity. But materialism is a never-ending quest for material things. You won't need it, but you want it. I want it anyhow. 
There won't be a need in your life. You'll be having something, you'll just want something. It's a never-ending quest. And it is something that propels you to keep doing things that you don't normally want to do. That's why it is demonically inspired. What should I do as far as materialism is concerned? I must learn to apply the cross in my life so that the power of materialism is broken. Remember, the Bible teaches us very, very clearly, godly contentment is great gain. Amen. Amen. And it's time people in the church learn to share this with others. In the church. Godly contentment. Do you have something? Be contented. Let there be a contentment which comes into your heart because God has provided. Not a continuous striving. Because after a point of time, it enters the area of covetousness. It enters the area of materialism. Sad to say, there are many today in the church who don't know the difference between the God kind of prosperity and materialism and their words they use is an ambiguous way of using Terms. They know the terms. They don't know the way God provides. They're using words with ambiguity so that when people see, they think, maybe this is only prosperity. My friends, that is not prosperity. God kind of prosperity is not materialism. Materialism is a continuously want. There is a want all the time. You can't be satisfied. There is no contentment. And I'm telling you this because I want you to pay close attention to what I'm saying Avoid any attempts by the enemy to influence you to follow a materialistic pattern of living. You will have to learn that. I remember meeting an elderly uncle who I respect highly. Son is a pastor. He said, over the last few years, I have stopped personally taking things for myself. And I instead use it for the kingdom. And everything you see on me, the shirt and trouser that I wear right now, was gifts that came as a result of what I did. Why? Because God has blessed me with everything. I just thought for one moment, what a far cry from the present day Christian disciple who is continuously wanting the latest things in life. This has come, this is what I want. Hey friends, that's not what the Bible tells us prosperity is all about. Sure, God wants us to have the best. But it's not a continuous striving and striving and striving to get things all the time. While we neglect what God has placed before us, the kingdom of God and the winning of souls that gets high priority. Hallelujah. That's what gets high priority. I'm never impressed with people who continuously you know, run after material things. I feel sad for them. I feel very sad for people who are continuously striving and striving and striving to get things that have no meaning for them. Because soon after they have bought it, the desire for that has left. What happens is they play with it. It's like a toy. They play with it for some time, then they throw it away. Now they're looking for the next thing, the next gadget, the next thing. It's a continuous striving for things that don't bring lasting contentment. But remember... When you walk the path of a Christian disciple, you remember this very carefully. There are many people who are going through right now situations that keeps them in a place where they don't have the kind of joy, peace and blessing that you are privileged and I am privileged to have even right now. Simply because maybe the government doesn't permit it in their land. Maybe they're not able to worship the Lord. Sometimes they do. You won't have a Christian bookstore in the entire nation. They can't get a Bible. And if people are splurging themselves with the wrong kind of things in the other kind in the other nations of this world, then we'll come to a place where we must be accountable for what we are doing. That's why Christian stewardship must be clearly understood and taught. Christian stewardship. What do I have? I have the word. I have the, the blessing to be able to pray. I have the blessing of being able to stand with people and pray. Which not too many people have. So I will be accountable if I play with that. 
Now look at Matthew's Gospel chapter 6. This entire teaching, 5, 6, 7, Sermon on the Mount, has attracted even unbelievers. Because these are profound teachings on the principles that God has for His people. Profound teachings. It says, your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Even before you ask, he knows what you need. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Mark it down. He did not say pray this prayer. If he did, then we need to pray this prayer. He said, after this manner, this is a model. Your prayer life must have these things in it, if it's going to be effective. After this manner, therefore, Pray ye. Why? Because earlier he was teaching about the heathen. They don't know how to pray. You look at a man on the road and tell him pray. He'll just stand quietly like this with his eyes wide open. He assumes the stand, stance of prayer. But he doesn't know how to pray. Now Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. So he says, after this manner, therefore pray ye. That means if your prayer life is modeled like this, then you will have an effective prayer life. Your prayers will not go unanswered. The heathen's prayers go unanswered. They are generic prayers. They are not focused on an answer. Lord, if you will give me. Now, praying that prayer, if you will give me, sounds spiritual, sounds humble. But it also exposes ignorance. Especially if the man knows the word. For example, if you are praying, Lord, if it is your will, let me be saved. You are expressing ignorance that it is God's will to save. Amen. That's what you are doing. It may sound spiritual to an unspiritual man. But to a spiritual man, he will look at you and he will look at you strange. He will say, my God. Poor man, he doesn't even know that God is already willing that all should be saved and that none should go to hell. And that's why he's made provision of salvation through Jesus Christ for every man. So, here Jesus starts off by saying, after this manner, therefore pray ye. It's a model prayer. It was not meant to be prayed just like that. It's just a model prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. I like that phrase. What is the phrase? He didn't say my Father. He said our Father. He is lifting the Christian believer and giving him an identity. Amazing. Amazing. All the time, remember Jesus said my Father. My Father, you are of the devil. Your Father, what he tells you will do. He told the Pharisees that but now he is teaching his disciples he is lifting the disciples to the same plane the same status the same standing that he is having not even an iota less please write it down later when you are alone and you see a mountain standing before you don't know what to do don't sit and get confused don't say if Jesus only was here my friends the same thing that happened in Jesus was here will happen if you will speak the word. Hallelujah. The same thing. There will be no difference. Write it down. There will be no difference whatsoever. Because the word that Jesus is introducing there is an amazing word. He says, our father. Amen. Which art in heaven. Again, Father's relationship. Which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. He's starting off with praise. He's talking of relationship. He's talking of righteousness. Same standing with him. Our, our Father. Righteousness. Please write these things down. As you see these things, prayer becomes dynamic. You won't sit and keep repeating this prayer like a parrot when 20 people who don't know the Lord keep saying, Our Father, my God, they don't even know who's Father. Because when you know who's Father, you won't follow it up by saying, I'm a worm. 
Because you'll never hear Jesus saying, Our father, or my father, I'm a worm. If you know him as father, then you're sons. Hallelujah. Sons. How many of you read the newsletter? Please take your copy, read it. Very important. It's as important as listening to the word. Why? Because I've written a little bit about it there. If God wanted you to be called a worm, he would have created you to be a worm. He's not confused about creation. He would have created you to be a worm. But remember, worms were not created in the likeness and the image of God. There was only one person who was created in the image and likeness of God, man. And if God calls you a man, then call yourself a man. Don't call yourself an animal. I wish people would tell people that. We are hearing preachers talking nonsense sometimes without staying in the word. They are teaching, call yourself something else. God doesn't want you to call yourself something else. He wants you to call yourself the way He calls you. Amen. Amen. Don't call yourself something extra. Don't call yourself something less. Call yourself the way God calls you. He calls you a son. Say, I am a son. The problem is He doesn't call us a son. He calls us a sons. So we say, yes, Lord, we are sons. Plural. Plural. We are sons of God. We are saints. We are believers. We are more than conquerors. Amen. Praise God. Now let's read on. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He's talking about the name even before he starts the prayer. Why? Because God is everything that his name is. Amen. You want him to bring peace to your family situation? He is Jehovah Shalom. Amen. Hallelujah. You want him to provide for your needs and you see and hear people talking about sowing and getting 17 times more, 1000 times more, again 17 times more. Well, he is Jehovah Jireh and El Shaddai. Hallelujah. Hallowed be thy name. Lord, I lift up your name. Your Yahweh, Elohim, the Lord God, your God Almighty. Someone put it like this, Satan can be mighty, but God is almighty. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Lift up that name. Worship that name. Praise that name. Sometimes we just start praying. Father, I want this. Even before you lifted up the name. So what happens is when prayer ends, you are having doubt whether the prayer is answered. Why? Because you never took time to lift up that name, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord God who makes provision even before the need arises. Talk about the ram caught in the ticket. Yesterday we went to see the new premises. Brother Stephen said, what a big ram was caught in the ticket. <laughs> Such a big ram. When you enter the place only you'll know what I'm talking about. It's amazing. The size really doesn't matter. If it's caught in the ticket, it's caught in the ticket. Till the time comes for the ram to be released. Till the time comes when you lift up your eyes. Till the time comes you call upon the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now look at this very, very clearly. It's amazing how God teaches us to lift up that name. Hallowed be thy name. The name. Thy kingdom come. What's the meaning of the word kingdom? Kingdom is the power of God, the authority of God, the dominion of God, the people of God. So many things are found in that one word kingdom. Remember for kingdom to operate, there must be a king. For the king to be powerful, he must have power, authority. Then, for him to be able to exercise dominion, he must have people beneath him. He must have subjects, people, or he is a king without power. Not too long ago we read about the king who came back to the nation of Afghanistan. For years together he was in exile in Paris. A king without people. Of what use is he? He can sit and shout for all he cares. No, there will be no one in Paris who will take note of him. 
Why? Because they don't come under his rulership. But when he does come back and power is vested upon him, even now it's not that kind of a rulership in Afghanistan, but just take it in the context in which we see, if a king does come back and power is given to him, authority is given to him, well, then when he says something, people will obey. Talk about a shepherd boy becoming a king, King David. When he spoke, people listened. God helped the man who never listened to David. There were a few. They paid with their lives. One was Nabal. He paid with his life. Shimi, another man. He paid with his life. Remember, once that rulership is established, that's why, circle the word, thy kingdom come. Today we are praying, my kingdom come. Nobody wants you to establish your kingdom. God's looking for people who will have only one thing that is their heartbeat. Your kingdom, Lord. Your kingdom, Lord. Your kingdom, Lord. That's it. We heard Brother Abraham teaching during the lamb feeder's training. I'm going to give you the secret, he said. And even later, Brother Anand said the same thing. Only one thing we're going to teach you. Pray, pray, pray. Some thought pray, then they'll tell something else. No, there's only one thing. Pray, pray, pray. The same thing applies here. There's only one thing that is on our heart. One agenda, God's kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thy kingdom come. When that is your burning desire, to see the kingdom of God established on earth, in the midst of everything which is negative, then God can't do less than what you are asking for. <laughs> what did Silas and Paul do in prison? They were sitting and bragging about the power of God in the night. To start off, I'm sure all the prisoners booed these two. You know how prisoners can boo you? Oh, they keep banging, banging, banging. After some time, their hands would have pain, their mouths would have shut. And then... Here are these two people, Silas shouting and singing, Oh God Almighty, you are Yahweh Elohim. <laughs> How you brought the children of Israel out of the land of bondage, took them into the promised land. Then, Paul not to be outdone, he says, Well, what about the walls of Jericho that came down when they shouted seven times, Oh, hallelujah! Bragging about the power of God. Bragging about the bigness of God. Don't brag about nothing else. You just keep doing it. In your prayer life, you'll get up and you'll walk out of that place far more stronger in your heart than you entered into that closet. Before you prayed, you would have gone in depressed, dejected down. Just start speaking about the power. Thy kingdom come, O Lord. Lord, there's nothing else that is on my mind. It's just one agenda. Just one purpose, that your kingdom should be established. And of course, you'll have to back it up with your act. <laughs> There's one thing to say it in prayer. There's another thing to back it with an act. Remember in Bible school, one boy came and joined Bible school. He wouldn't take down notes in the class. He would sit there, relax spiritual, close his eyes, do everything, go through all the motions. So one morning, the warden was going through the rounds. And it was early in the morning. He saw this boy on his knees. He's telling the Lord this. This is what happened truly. We know the boy. Lord, he's showing the action. Whatever you tell me, I'll write it down. Just speak the word. The warden tapped him on his shoulder. Told him, stop playing games with God. If you say you'll write down what he said, where's the paper and pen? Where's the paper and pen? You can't write like this. You better have paper and pen. What would have happened if Apostle Paul just sat in prison and wrote like this in the air? We wouldn't have had the book of Philippians. The book called the book of joy wouldn't have come into our hands. Let's stop playing games. We're playing games all the time and that's why prayer is not answered. 
And then we get up from prayer, we look at somebody who is spending time before the Lord and we go green-eyed with jealousy. Green-eyed with jealousy. Why did he get it? My friends, you spend time with the Lord yourself, you will find people looking and being amazed with the testimonies. You have to give yourself. Why? Because when you have only one agenda, thy kingdom come. We are tired of all the kingdoms in this world, Lord. We just want one kingdom, your kingdom. Let that be established. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. What does it mean? Pray the word. Once you are focused on the power, once you are focused on the name, now pray the word. Why? Because the word is his will and the will of God is his word. How do I know God's will if God keeps it in his heart and keeps thinking about it? I won't know his will. Amen. That's why they encourage people to write down a will, a testament. That's their last testament. You can have many wills. But the last one that you made will go into effect the moment you close your eyes. Why? Because that will be the last word or your last desire that you had prior to your leaving that you would want to see happen after your lifetime. Now this is God's last word to us. Amen. Amen. This is the first word and the last word. Not the devil's word. That's why he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the ending. If God said something about healing, then... Don't sit and say, Lord, if it is your will, please heal me. Remember it is his will. Remember the provision has been made. Remember to go and get what belongs to you. What belongs to you, you take. Amen. Amen. Don't settle for anything less than that. The devil will give you quarter. He's famous for all these things. He'll just give you quarter. <laughs> He'll try to distract you. He'll say, after all, see, after all that headache left, now why are you so bothered about the leg pain? One left. Say, no, I want all to leave. <laughs> I want all to go. I want everything to leave. Every kind of uncleanness. No, just a small demon. Whether it's small or big, that demon must leave. <laughs> that uncleanness must go. That pain in the family must leave. The pain is not the person. The pain is the demon behind <laughs> the person. Don't sit and call somebody a pain. Thinking the person is the pain. Behind him, working, giving unclean thoughts, giving unclean suggestions. Just like God speaks to you. Don't forget it. All of us were there but one time. Amen. Before we got saved, we were listening to the devil. We may not like to accept it openly, but we were all the children of the devil. I was at least. I don't know about you. And I used to get complete revelation from him. What to do, how to do, why to do, how to justify Live like the devil. Well, thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. He changed it all. Now, what happens is, I choose to listen to his voice. But if there's somebody who doesn't choose to listen to his voice, he's listening to an unclean spirit. He's also, maybe sometimes listening to the flesh speaking. The old man. Instead of identifying with the death of the old man with Jesus, he is letting the old man speak. And when the old man speaks, he speaks nonsense. Rubbish. Filth. There is nothing good in the flesh. Amen. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Corruption. All this comes out. When you see somebody talking, all this, it is coming from the flesh. Now, Matthew 6 is powerful. He says, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now you asked the question earlier. If God knows everything, then why should I pray? The answer is there. If you want it to operate in earth, then you pray. Because your prayer is the legal right for God to operate in earth. Why? Because initially, rulership and lordship was given to man, Adam. The devil robbed it from Adam. Lied to Adam. Robbed it. 
robbed it from Eve. So he became the ruler of this world. And he is still called the prince of the power of the air. Now you want something to operate in earth, then you and I must learn to pray. Pray the word will bring God on the scene. Use the name will bring eternity into that place. They're just staying in a small place. Doesn't matter. Heaven can be there. Heaven can be there. Use the name Jesus, you are transported into heaven and God comes on the scene. You are transported into the very throne room. You are there. And what happens is he is here. He begins to work. You may be here in the flesh, but you are standing before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. So the place where you are becomes heaven. That place becomes heaven. That place becomes the place where you are enforcing the rulership of God. The lordship of his name. Eternity begins to dominate time. Right? Now we are operating in a place called time. There won't be a clock like this when we go from here. Hallelujah. There won't be a clock. There won't be a watch. One of the few things we'll be leaving behind... When the rapture happens is our times. That's why don't invest in two big time pieces. <laughs> Wasting your time <laughs> doing it. Buying expensive watches. Some people don't even understand this. <laughs> when the rapture takes place, we are taking off. Hallelujah. We are going. Going to a place of eternity. There's no time there. The Greek word is eon. It's a word that continuously keeps repeating itself. There is no end. Never ending. It's hard for us to think about it today because it will blow our minds. Never ending. Keeps going on and 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 on. It's eons upon eons upon eons upon eons. That's the word, eternity. There's no full stop. And if God says he is eternity, personified, then imagine how never ending he is and you can't even think about a beginning for God. No beginning. We don't even know from where, where he came. No beginning, no ending. So let's come back to this place. Others will all be transported into heaven right now. <laughs> it says, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This is the way you pray, Jesus said. Mark that phrase, as it is in heaven. In heaven, if there is no uncleanness, Lord, then in my life there shouldn't be uncleanness. All of us will have traces of it. But as we let Jesus live through us, continuously, like Paul says, we die daily. Some think we died 15 years ago, and after that no death. No. The daily death to uncleanness, self, everybody, no one is free from it. Please, let's not get, you know, feel guilty or condemned at this point. Everybody has traces of it. But those traces will leave and we will be changed into the image of Jesus when the cross is applied. You're saved through the blood, but you live an overcoming life. By the application of the cross daily. That's why Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me daily. Daily. Daily, it's a death. Will it be pleasant? I don't think so. Death is never pleasant. You go to a house of mourning, it's not a pleasant time. Do you see them jumping and running around and, you know, fooling around? No, it's a time of, even if it is in the house of a believer... It's not a time of, you know, merriment. Because there is the joy of knowing that the person has gone to heaven. But in the midst of it, the twinge of pain is there that somebody has left you whom you knew. Well, amen. So look at this very, very clearly. As it is in heaven, just like things happen in heaven, Lord, I want them to happen in earth. How will they happen if I follow the other three principles? 
carefully. Now, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. After all this, only the request comes. Sometimes I've heard people, young baby Christians saying, you can make one minute prayer. You can make a one minute prayer, I think. And I'm a man of God. After you have had the one hour of prayer earlier. You don't have a prayer life, you make a one minute prayer in big trouble. The devil will answer also. You won't even know what he's talking. Talk about a man who's having a problem with alcoholism, praying one minute prayer as he walks on this number one Wadagram road. The first thing he'll see is the wine shop. He'll jump in. God answered the prayer. No, God didn't answer that prayer. He made the one minute prayer. He did not know the will of God. He had not spent time with God. So he thought that was the answer. The first open door, let me jump in. Please get this right. It may sound humorous. But these are principles you must understand. Don't listen to anyone who justifies a lifestyle of no prayer. Take Jesus, clearest model we have. Long hours with the Father. And then he would go about doing good. Long hours with the Father. Sometimes he would get up early to pray. Sometimes the entire night is spent in prayer. Man of God called Smith Wigglesworth said, I don't make long prayers. I don't pray long prayers. But there's not half an hour that goes by when I don't pray. <laughs> well, if you're living like that, fine. But if you're not living like that, there's one minute prayers in the morning and then starting the day. Not from God. Take time to be with Him. Take time to fellowship with Him. Walk with Him. Talk with him. Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Simple. Because after you have done all the rest, you will know that it is God's will that you don't go hungry. So you won't need to beg. You can ask. Right close to that. Ask. Request. No need to beg. I like verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Meaning, prayer must be a daily affair. Prayer must be daily. Done. Requests must be taken one day at a time. Don't sit and break it about 25 years from now. What am I going to do? Never sit and worry about that. Today, Lord, help me to be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing so that you will be glorified. Give us this day our daily bread. The word us is written there. That means he prayed daily. We should also pray daily. Daily. Now, the bread is talking about physical needs. So I can write that down. God is not against you asking to meet your physical needs. It can be rest. It can be food. It can be clothing. It can be anything that pertains to the physical body. God is as much interested in your physical body as he is interested in your spirit man. How many people say amen to that? He doesn't want you dressing bad. But at the same time, he wants you to know that dress alone doesn't make the believer. Amen. Praise God. So please mark this down. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. Very important place. As we forgive our debtors. We'll pray the first part very, very fast. The second part of verse 12, we leave off conveniently. Oh, I forgot. Oh, I didn't think of it like that. <laughs> it's amazing how people will come out with statements. Oh, I didn't think of it like that, Pastor. Really, is this both connected? Well, let's see verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. One phrase. In fact, there is no 
punctuation mark in the original. As we forgive our debtors shows the extent to which you can expect forgiveness. Hard? Well, most of the things Jesus said was hard. That's why we need a savior. That's why we need a healer. That's why we need a redeemer. And that's why we need a comforter to stand with us and help us walk the Christian life. How many sang that song earlier? It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit. Amen. Nice to sing the song. This mountain shall be removed. Oh, hallelujah. Well, the mountain will be removed when we walk and do the things God wants us to do. Forgive us our debts. As we forgive the clause. I heard a man of God one time talk about it. David Duplessis was called Mr. Pentecost. Amazing man of God. He's talking about how important it is for us to learn forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It is a choice. Write it. Forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is the nature of God. Amen. It is an It is not an emotion. It is the nature of God. When you forgive, you let go. And when you let go, you let God work. You and I are not strong to handle vengeance. We will break. We will disintegrate. I don't want you to try it. I'll there are many times I say, try it, try it. There are certain things I don't want you to try it. You'll break yourself. You can't handle vengeance. Because with vengeance comes bitterness, hatred, uncleanness. You'll sit and always be sitting and planning and plotting how to do this to that man. You'll even contemplate murder. Don't, it'll break you up. Look at any person who has a problem with Ulcers, high blood pressure. What does the doctor say? Don't have, don't be tensed. Don't have tension. Sometimes you'll be wondering, what is this tension all about? Well, as you sit and start talking to the man, you'll find the person say, but it is only this person who is giving me the problem. It is only that person. Well, that person is harboring bitterness, hatred. Once you forgive, just let God do. Trust him enough to do it. He'll do it well. He will do it well. He will work things out. He will fight for us. He will do things that will amaze you. We had an amazing testimony on the men's prayer. How a brother had gone to Andhra, traveled by the Shatapti Express, a new train. A train when he went from here to Andhra, went five minutes early in every station. But when his return trip, when he had to get the train at 5.55, he found that he was leaving the place of his work only at 5.55. The train stops only two minutes in that particular station. And he said, I didn't know what to do. I just said in Jesus' name and kept praying in tongues. The person who traveled with me said, well, that train never runs late. The devil said, when you came itself, the train was running five minutes early, every station. He said, no, let's go to the station. So they came to the station and the man, the unbeliever, that's why the Bible says, you're believers. The unbeliever said, I'll sit in the car and wait. I'm not willing to waste my energy. You want to go to the station and see. They entered the station ten minutes after the scheduled stop. Talk about faith. This is faith. They entered the station. He asked a man. The man said, the train's not come. He thought the man didn't know what he was saying because there's a newly introduced train. Nobody knows about it still. It's hardly a month old. So he ran up to the station master and asked. The station master said, sir, 
the train is 10 minutes, 20 minutes late in this station. He said, I had time to buy a cool drink. I had time to drink it along with my friend, the unbeliever. Say, so he'll, he'll be blessed because of you. The train didn't run late for him. It ran late for that believer. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen carefully. The miracle is not over. The 20 minutes passed. The train steamed in, stood for two minutes. And then it hit the road or hit the track, <laughs> as you will have it. And it went in five minutes ahead of time in the next station. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's put the devil to shame. It's time we started exercising what God has given us. We are sitting and letting the devil tell us, this is the time. Who, who is he to dictate time to you? He didn't even introduce time. He is sitting and dictating things according to him. Remember, time is divided not by the name of Lucifer, but time is divided by the name of Jesus. Before Christ, after Christ. Hallelujah. Even there, the Lordship of God is the determining factor, not Lucifer's name. Don't you dare sit and listen to the lie of the enemy. You sit and listen to lies, well, you will see the lie operating in your life. You'll see the lie operating in your life. If you'll say, no, I won't have this lie. I'll stand up against it in Jesus' name. Well, you'll see what the Bible says happening in your life. Hallelujah. I was just sitting and going over the newsletters, old ones, past issues. They're so current. <laughs> I've written earlier. You want to see, if you want to see Bible miracles happen, then you must have Bible faith. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Bible miracles, Bible faith. And you will see Bible faith happening. If you will stay in the word. We are going to continue this next week. But don't forget verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Somebody hurt you, don't say I'm not feeling like doing anything. Nobody asked you to feel. If at all there's something you need to feel for is the word. <laughs> Choose to forgive. Amen. Loud Amen, please. Choose to forgive. Choose to let go. Choose to let God be in control. Don't think he can't handle a situation. You are more smart than him to handle it. He knows how to handle it. When he handles it, believe me, I've seen him tackling people who think that they are high and mighty. When he handles a situation, those people who thought they are high and mighty will be running around from pillar to post not knowing the answers. Till that time, they'll be the smart ones around. They'll be having the answers all the time. It will look like everything is going their side. But when he starts dealing, believe me, they'll start spinning like tops. Even a top you can see when it spins. These people, you won't be able to see them for some time. You'll ask them later, what happened? You'll just say, my God, this happened and that happened and this happened. Please pray for me. They'll make their peace with you. They'll come back to you. They'll say, please pray for me. Believe. When you forgive, you are becoming God-like. Hallelujah. Amen. You are becoming God-like. You are forgiving and expressing the very nature of God. Hallelujah. We will continue looking at this next two.